Welcome everybody. My name is Andreas Meyer and I am the host of the Pattern Recognition Symposium. In this semester we were completely online, which means that I can show some of the presentations to you in this video format. So the next presentation will be given by Faze Niyati Hatamian and it's entitled The Effect of Data Augmentation on Classification of Atrial Fibrillation in short single lead ECG signals using deep neural networks. So, Faise, the stage is yours. My name is Faiza Nedrati Hatamian. I'm a PhD student at Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nuremberg. Our paper is titled The Effect of Data Augmentation on Classification of Atrial Fibrillation in Short Single Lead ECG Signals Using Deep Neural Networks. This work has been done in collaboration with Fraunhofer Institute, IAS, and the University of Leeds. So, as every step that we take in our life um, has its own motivation, this work was not an exception and we got inspired by the fact that heart diseases are most leading causes of this worldwide. And among these heart disorders, atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia. It is worth mentioning that atrial fibrillation increases the risk of a stroke by five times. So. If we can detect atrial fibrillation in earlier stages, we can prevent a stroke and also we can reduce or prevent the cost for hospitalization or nursing cares. So what atrial fibrillation is? Um, to notice, we need to know that the heart pacemaker or sinoatrial node or SA node generates impulses regularly throughout the heart and these impulses leads to contractions and these contractions are translated into PQRS complex. If there is malfunction in pacemaker, um, then the heart starts to quiver, and in some cases it beats even faster. As it is depicted in the right-hand side uh, image, uh, which shows a normal ECG sample and an atrial fibrillation one, um, P peak is missing in AF sample and is substituted by um, fibrillatory wave or F wave. Generally, people follow this classification pipeline that they try to segment the signals into equal sizes as normally classifiers or deep neural network classifiers need to be fed uh, with equal size of signals. Then they use it um, as a training data and fit it into the classifier. What we followed was slightly different. We segmented the signals into smaller sizes, uh, but at the same time, um, as we were suffering from data imbalance, we extracted atrial fibrillation class, uh, which was the minority class. Uh, we fitted our generative model on it and then uh, we sampled as many samples um, we needed and uh, used them as synthesized data. And this synthesized data together with the original data was fed into the classifier. Now let's see uh, which tools we use to uh, balance our classes. The first thing uh, that came to our mind was um, using oversampling, which was nothing else but duplicating the minor class as many times as required till the equalization of both classes. This way we could balance our both classes, but basically we were not adding extra information to the data set. So that's why we thought of using generative algorithms like Gaussian mixture model. If we have access to the source distribution of the data, we can sample as many samples um, as we need. 
But in real world, this is not the case. Uh, we have access to the data only, but not its source distribution. Here, uh, GMM comes into play and says, okay, if I have more than one Gaussian distribution or component, I can weight them and sum them up and then estimate the underlying distribution of the data. Um, here you can see the formula of Gaussian mixture model. W represents the mixture weight, X is the data, uh, mu is the mean, and sigma is the covariance matrix. And in order to estimate these parameters, GMM uses um, expectation maximization algorithm. And finally, we tried the generative adversarial networks or GANs. Um, GANs are consisted of two networks. One of them is generator, the other one is discriminator. We can think of generator as a forger, for example, and a discriminator as a police officer. So the goal here is to fool the discriminator so that he or she, I mean the police officer, cannot distinguish between the fake and the real data. Um, in this work, we used deep convolutional guns or DC guns. And as you can see here, this is the architecture of the generator. And this is the discriminator that we used. And comparison to the normal gun, um, convolutional layers are used instead of dense layers in almost all cases. Um, and max pooling is uh, replaced by the stroided convolution. And upsampling is replaced by the stroided transposed convolution. The data set we used is the publicly available data set uh, provided by the PhysioNet Challenge 2017. It contains around 6,000 EC2 signals and among them around 700 ones are atrial fibrillation ones and 5,000 ones are the normal ones. And uh, following the main objective in our work, we kept the normal and AF classes and discarded the noisy and other rhythm ones. As we can see here, these numbers resemble normal class is seven times larger than the atrial fibrillation one. And uh, it is worth mentioning that the EC2 signals are sampled by sampling rate of uh, 300 Hertz. The signals in this data set are of various lengths, from 9 seconds to 60 seconds of length. And as it is shown in this histogram, the majority of the signals are uh, 30 seconds and uh, 60 seconds. Um, the segment length that we opted for was 1500. Uh, which is uh, translated to five seconds. Our data division policy was as follows. We took 20% uh, of the whole data set um, as the test set. Then we divided the remaining 80% into 90% training and 10% um, validation set. For our classification architectures, we followed uh, one of the leading deep learning based uh, works in the PhysioNet Challenge 2017 by Tillman and others um, for the evaluation purposes. Basically, they proposed two different architectures and um, in both architectures, 2D spectrogram is used as the input. SOA CNN on the left, um, includes six convolutional blocks. Each block consists of uh, six um, sub-blocks uh, with a convolutional layer with five by five kernel size, then a batch normalization uh, followed by a ReLU activations and a dropout layer. The last uh, sub-block contains um, a max pooling layer here. The first three convolutional layers have um, 64 filters while the last convolutional layer start with 64 uh, filters in the first block and the number of filters um, is um, increased by the factor of 32 for each subsequent block. The right hand side architecture differs in terms of the number of blocks and um, LSTM layer is replaced by a temporal averaging layer. 
the parameters uh, used uh, uh, in this architecture was um, mean standard deviation normalization. We used Adam optimizer with the learning rate of uh, 10 to the power of minus three and the decay rate of 10 to the power of minus five. We used binary cross entropy loss function and Xavier uniform was used as a weight initialization. The other hyperparameters that I didn't mention here are the default hyperparameters of Keras 224. For our spectrogram, we used a two-key window with the window size of 64 and a hop length of 32. And our DC gun um, has Adam optimizer again, and we trained it on the 2D logarithmic spectrograms with the segment length of uh, 1500. And now it's time to share our results with you. Um, the below table uh, presents the classification results that are um, computed using different uh, data augmentation algorithms, namely oversampling, GMM, and DCGON. Mm, and for the sake of comparison, we have also reported the results without augmentation or basically none. F1 stands for the F1 score. Um, AF um, represents AF class accuracy and N stands for the normal class accuracy. As we can see, um, GMM uh, gives us better F1 score than um, DC guns. However, DC gun results uh, in a better AF class accuracy. It can be observed that uh, using data augmentation always outperforms uh, no augmentation uh, with respect to F1 score. Another interesting observation was that in the majority of cases applying um, augmentation on the AF class resulted in an improvement in both the AF accuracy and the total F1 score. In this slide, um, in the upper part, uh, we have three sample signals from our data set. Um, the upper row shows the 1D signals and the lower row shows their corresponding 2D spectrograms. In the lower left, the signals that are generated by GMM um, both in 1D and their corresponding 2D spectrograms are depicted. On the right, we can see the generated spectrograms uh, by generative adversarial networks. As we can see, the spectrograms which are um, generated by DCGON visually resemble the R peaks in our uh, real signals. Uh, I mean, this vertical lines here. And however, the signals which are generated by GMMs um, may seem to be noisy. However, as GMM resulted in high classification performance improvement, uh, it should have learned the underlying distribution of the AF class uh, distinctive characteristics. So to conclude and summarize what we learned and gained throughout this work um, in terms of data augmentation, the oversampling data augmentation was the least resource demanding technique. And in some cases, its performance was comparable, if not better to using no data augmentation at all, uh, which was not a surprise for us. Um, the best classification performance in terms of F1 score uh, was achieved when GMM uh, data augmentation was used. Um, however, GMM in 1D signal uh, classification showed very inconsistent behavior. And regarding DCGON, DCGON outperformed no augmentation and oversampling. It produced comparable results to GMM and we got the best uh, AF class accuracy using DCGON. Time constraint left us with uh, some gaps to be addressed as our future work, like investigation on effect of different gun variants, like improved Wasserstein gun. Also, we would like to apply the learning-based augmentation algorithms like GMM or GON 
on the normal class to see whether any distinctive feature can be learned in order to reduce its confusion with the AF class. Thank you for your attention and goodbye.